Good day, everyone, and welcome to the first virtual edition of the Arab Startup Competition. Joining me today is Michael Schraj, Research Fellow with MIT Sloan School's Initiative on the Digital Economy and Research Associate at MIT's Media Lab. Today, we'll be discussing how the next AI transforms entrepreneurial performance. And when we're saying AI here, it's not what everyone is thinking of, not artificial intelligence. It's augmenting introspection. Based on academic research and COVID-19 advisory experiences, this brief talk is going to highlight lessons learned from leading innovators striving to turn disruption into opportunity. Either rethink how their people, processes, and technologies actually create value. They need greater self-awareness and situational awareness. Dispersed and distributed organizations now overwhelmingly rely on novel data and analytics to transform radical self-improvement. I will leave the floor for Michael now after a quick um, presentation and the keynote speech from his end, we will be having a discussion. So stay tuned and I hope you enjoy this as much as I will. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you so much for that very kind and generous introduction. It is both a pleasure and an honor to remotely offer this presentation and offer this talk and the insights that I've gotten from working with a variety of different organizations during this highly unusual remote, dispersed, distributed time. The introduction that you heard is an excellent setup. Um, I want the individuals and entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial teams listening to this to think of this as a practical talk as well as a visionary talk. There are genuine next steps you can take as a result of this. And I look forward to the questions that come after so that we perhaps can even go into greater detail in that regard. My title is Going Beyond Remote. And as was mentioned, it's the next AI that I'm going to be talking about. <clears throat> and this is really my most important slide. The content of the audience is more important than the content of the talk. These remarks are going to be focused. I can't say that I don't know that much about Middle Eastern entrepreneurship, but I am aware of startups and entrepreneurs from the work that I do at MIT. And I believe that many of the lessons and insights are directly relevant. And so I am going to try to tailor as much of my learnings to the, what I perceive and understand to be the needs of the participants here. Let's begin with the obvious and where everybody agrees. Everyone's remote, everyone's distributed, everyone's dispersed. The notion of face-to-face -face in a physical sense has been transformed to the virtual face-to-face. -face. And it's been remarkable to see how clever and innovative and adaptive many organizations have been in confronting and getting value from this new reality. And when I've been called by my former executive ed students and my clients, what everyone asks me, what literally everyone asks me is, how can we get our people to perform better? in this environment. This is as true for global banks with over 85,000 employees as for startups with half a dozen people. How can we get our people to perform better in this environment? What can we do? People are talking with each other. They're saying, what can we do though? How can we do this not just to recover, but to discover new ways of adding value? But let me tell you the most important thing that I've learned. The most important thing that I've learned from listening and observing is that remote work works, but really most people don't understand how work actually gets done. That is to say, we're delivering results, we're doing things, but in terms of the actual interpersonal and technical dynamics, it's kind of a black box to project managers in particular to project managers in general and to top managers in particular. And I think this is a disadvantage that can be turned into an opportunity because the point and purpose of this brief talk is to measurably improve remote performance. That's the challenge. How do we measurably improve people's performance in a non-physical face-to-face environment in a remote 
distributed, dispersed environment? And this is the essential question that entrepreneurs have to honestly confront. Because most of the entrepreneurs I know are so customer focused, product focused, user experience focused, and code and deliverable focused, that they treat performance a little too much like a means as much as an end. How do you and your organization define and determine high performance? What does high performance mean? What is the culture and operation and platform for high performance? That's absolutely key. If you are an entrepreneur, if you're leading an entrepreneurial team, you better have a very clear vocabulary and vision of what you want high performance to mean relative to ordinary or regular performance. So this brief talk is really about how do we improve organizational awareness on that dimension? You see below a link to a Sloan management review piece that just came out this week, the first week of June, that raises and discusses many of these issues. I urge you to look at it. It's free for the time being. And that's what makes this talk work about AI, as was introduced, augmented introspection. What do I mean by augmented introspection? What am I asking you to do when I say I want you to invest in augmented introspection? I'm gonna offer two dimensions of AI that if you're not familiar with, you should become very familiar with. The first is the notion of the quantified self. You know, the Fitbit, the Apple Watch. This is work from over a decade ago, 2007, from, from Kevin Kelly and Gary Wolf, the quantified self, self-understanding through numbers. How do you instrument individuals so that you get keener and better insight into their behavior? For the most part, quantified self has a certain physical, you know, how many, 10,000 steps, et cetera, et cetera. But there are other dimensions of the quantified self that need to be considered. This book, it's about five years old. It's by the former chief people officer of, of uh, Google, Laszlo Bach, who's become an entrepreneur, launched Humu, H-U-M-U, interesting organization. Google was a pioneer of people analytics. They really looked, they hired great coders, great project managers. They wanted to really improve people's performance. These were talented people. How do we get an even, and we pay them a lot of money, how do we boost the return on these people? This is why people analytics and this book, Work Rules, illustrate some of the fundamental principles here. But what's the key thing that's emerging? The key high performance call to action I'm making is that if you are a serious entrepreneur, if you want to run a startup that scales, you have to create a virtuous cycle between learning to measure and measuring to learn. What do you want to learn to measure what do you want to measure to learn? I'm pausing because that needs to become not just a management principle, not just an organizing principle, but a leadership principle for your startup team. How do you get alignment between these things? Leadership means getting people aligned around the culture and practice of high performance. And let me give you an example I was working with a big global bank. It shall remain nameless. They have tens of thousands of people and they wanted to improve their organizational awareness. And they were saying, well, you know, yeah, we have meetings. Yeah, they work, we, they don't use Zoom. They have certain security issues. But what did we talk about? What did we do that really began to make a difference in top management's organizational awareness what did we do that facilitated augmenting introspection? Well, you've got all, you've got remote workers distributed all over the world. Why not use social network analysis algorithms to identify centrality, to see which workers and work groups are hubs, which ones are choke points, which ones are platforms. Let's analyze those flows. Let's see what people correspond to what, what product and process flows. But guess what else? We're also concerned about people's morale. 
So here you have an organization that's using stuff like Microsoft Teams and using Slack. Why not do sentiment analysis and see how people actually in different regions and different geographies actually feel about things? To be sure, your organization may not be the size and scale where social network analysis and sentiment analysis writ large is the right way to go but that's what you design to scale for. That's where you, you bake in augmenting introspection from the get-go. How do you want to monitor performance? What do we need to improve organizational awareness around that's simple, scalable, and impactful? One of the most important things that I've come away with with organizations is that they're encouraging and sometimes even imposing time tracking software like rescue time and clockify and they're building dashboards so that people can track what many organizations believe is their people's most valuable asset their time how are we spending our time on our machines right because we're not going to the to the coffee we're not doing tea we're not meeting face to face anymore we're doing all manner of networked and zoomed meetings like this one what can we learn by doing time tracking from our machines? Where do we get the greatest value from our time? How does investment in time correlate to sentiment analysis, social network analysis, augmenting introspection? Are you tracking your time? Are you tracking your people's time? Are you building dashboards that tie into performance, people's performance, not just product and service and UX deliverables. Those are the kinds of questions I believe serious leaders take seriously. I'm gonna end with one example here. I was working with a law firm <clears throat> that had just, you know, they used to do client meetings, et cetera. I was talking with a law firm that developed the ability or that acquired the ability to do trans transcriptions, transcripts as a service because people were doing meetings, you know, now you could actually record the meetings and guess what, at the, at the end of the day, you could get transcripts of all the meetings that you were a part of. Gee, what a wonderful way to end the day. So they began to be concerned, how do we get value from this? We have this new digital capability. How do we get value from this? Should, should we appoint a single person to be in charge of transcribing or getting the highlights from particular meetings? Should we rank these things? Should we do it asynchronously? But the whole question was, we have a new digital enabled capability. How do we measurably get value from it? And so one of the things we talked about was transcriptions as a service metrics. What are the most valuable quotes or excerpts from these meetings? And by the way, some of these meetings are internal, some of them are with clients. What's the most shared quote or excerpt? What's the most useful quote or excerpts? And we're doing different versions. So we have ROI. What's the return on iteration? When, do, when are we spending too much time on our transcripts and excerpts? Why am I offering you this real, by the way, there's no resolution on it. Why am I offering you this example? I'm offering you this example because this is how serious leaders, serious managers, and serious organizations look at new capabilities. It's not just how do we take advantage of new capabilities, it's how do we hold ourselves accountable for getting value from that advantage of these new capabilities. Yes, this means you're not going to like my saying this. Yes, this means we're going to have to do this invites more workforce monitoring and surveillance. That's what is at the core of the quantified self and people analytics. And that means the greatest frustrations we're going to have are not going to be around the technology or the money but about organization and culture. You have to understand that when you take measurement seriously, you want to avoid having the kind of culture where compliance or control defines the way people see measurements value. I think we are moving to a time where leaders need to lead by example in a world of people analytics and the quantified self. We want more transparency for leaders to see what's going on, but we need to see greater transparency from leaders to understand why and how they are making the decisions they're making. 
actions speak louder than words. If you're an entrepreneur or part of an entrepreneurial team, you've got to ask yourself, how do I make myself more transparent for my people? How do I do a better job of leading by example? So I'll end with this slide that as important, important, important as strategy and strategic thinking is, the call, the challenge of this AI, augmented introspection, is going to be about culture. This is a call to make your culture more open and more sensitive to accountability in both meanings of the phrase. Accountability and responsibility and accountability in measuring and tracking how we create value with each other and for our customers and for our clients. I'm going to stop there and I look forward to the questions and the conversations and I really, really, really hope that this, these principles and these examples will prove directly relevant to the challenges you face. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. This was really very, very, very enlightening. And it reflects a lot what we've been living during the past few months. Millions of us have seen our careers transformed due to the coronavirus. And between furloughs, layoffs, and shifts in tasks, to adapt what we do and how we do it and accommodate social distancing, very few of us are working the way we were when we began 2020. So um, anticipating disruption before it happens defines whether you'll be the disruptor or the disrupted. But when you didn't plan for the disruption you are facing and without the right expertise, some businesses actually risk falling into irrelevance. So let me ask you this. Disruption is no longer a once in a career problem to be dealt with. It's a constant right. How can businesses help plot out the future in their industries rather than simply reacting to the future created by someone or something else? Well, that is a very good question. That is a very fair question. And, you know, I've literally written books about how one you know, I wrote a book called, Who Do You Want Your Customers to Become? You know, how you have different relationships with your customers and that innovation is not just about giving customers better products and services or experiences, but actually transforming their behaviors and norms. But let me tell you that no matter whether you take a customer orientation approach or a my workplace has been transformed and disrupted approach, you need to have situational awareness and self-awareness. The reality is, remember in the, in the olden days, six months ago, the IT help desk made sure your computer ran. Now, the IT help desk needs to make certain kinds of meetings and collaborations and software and sharing possible. So they've gone from support to partner, or more accurately, if they're not becoming a partner and they're just support, you're hurting yourself. So this, your question goes to the root of what I'm saying. What do we, in this time, are we defining performance and high performance in a constructive way? And if we agree that our definition is a good one, how are we monitoring and measuring that? I, you know, I'm a male, so I'm going to forgive this example, but the idea that I can go out in the physical world without looking in a mirror to see how to shave or how I, that's, that's ridiculous. Well, I'm going to forgive this metaphor, forgive this analogy. Data and analytics are the mirrors and the lenses by which we understand where we are and where we're going. Let me mix the metaphor. Data and analytics are the GPS for how we navigate through and with disruption. If we don't know where we are, if we don't know where our customers are, if we don't know where our suppliers are, if we don't know where our partners are, how can we win? How can we collaborate with them? How can we coordinate with them? So that is the real key message. It's not just do we do a better job of anticipating or a better job of responding, are we monitoring and measuring things so that if we want to be proactive, we can, and if we want to be reactive, we can. It's our choice. We're not victims 
we can take the lead and have agency in our own businesses. Nice. It's a nice example, even though <laughs> not very gender neutral. Um, I, I think, yes, my wife tells me that a lot. I am so sorry on that. So. <laughs> we'll we'll allow it. Yes. So as you said, um, situational awareness calls for mindfulness about new needs and new challenges. What would be, um, in your opinion, or from your side, two to three tips you would give business leaders to make sure they remain relevant during and after, specifically after such a pandemic? What's the easiest way to, get, to gather this data, to measure, and to stay relevant? Well, I want to be very, very careful here. Um, it can be easy, but there are implications. That is why there is this culture slide. Culture is very, you know, I'm doing this, I'm speaking to people in the Middle East. Middle Eastern culture is not the same as California culture, is not the same as New York culture, is not the same as German or Brazilian culture. So let's, let's not pretend that we're all alike in that regard. Cultural differences matter. But if you were to ask me simple, cheap, high impact, high influence next steps, I will give you three next steps. Have the leader write down two, write down, not talk, write down two or three ways he or she wants to lead by example. Not the kind of leader I want to be, not my ethos, my style. What are the examples that I set that enable leadership? The second I offered in my talk, download a Clockify or a Rescue Time and show your time, track your time. How do you spend your time on your machine? Is it on Zoom? Is it on spreadsheets? Is it doing product reviews? See how you spend your time. See how you analyze that. Analyze that. And then the final third, again, not, ex not expensive. The third one, share dashboards. Get people in their startups, in their small organizations to share dashboards. Let's create community and collaboration around KPIs key performance indicators, key metrics. I hope that you will agree that these are not expensive or time consuming investments to make. These are all investments in self-awareness. And I will continue with my sexist examples. Some people are perfectly happy to shave with a regular mirror. Maybe you want a magnifying mirror because there are other issues that you're concerned about with your skin that you want to work with higher resolution, you know? Those are the kinds of issues. What level of resolution for time? Do I want to do it by the minute? Do I, I'm tracking how I spend my time. Do I also want to see who I send the most email or text messages or, or, or uh, chat messages to? These are the kinds of things that you want to look at. What are the fastest, simplest, and cheapest ways to augment introspection? And given the intelligence and energy of your attendees here, these are people smart enough to get insight and take advantage of that data and analytics. So this is the right audience for this kind of a message. Nice. Moving into a slightly different uh, idea. So the speed of change is accelerating and yes. uh, some of the trends and what we were expecting from the future of work in the next 10 years has become suddenly imminent and we're yes. living by them now. So when do you expect digital businesses to adapt and start reviving economies globally? Because what we're awaiting to face now is not something that's very... Uh, you know, um, calming, it's alarming us and digital economies everywhere and economies are awaiting the next steps. So what do you expect is going to happen soon and how are we going to find the balance again on the global level? Well, I, I, I am, 
as much as I think highly of myself, I am not going to be too much of a futurist in, in, in that regard. I'm going to state a fundamental truth that I think is a fundamental truth. And I offer that as a guide for the people participating in your event. Um, we can be as innovative and as creative as we want, but the single most important gating factor are our customers, are our clients. So the issue to me is, are our clients, are our customers becoming digital customers in the right way, in a helpful way, in a growing way, in a way that, that is likelier to lead to healthy economic growth? So this is an opportunity. It's both a risk and an opportunity. It's how do we help we, we, we want to become more digital. How do we help our customers and clients become more digital? What kind of tools can we give them? What kind of internal things that we do should we be sharing with our customers? I cannot answer the macroeconomic question of when the Middle East will turn around or Latin America will turn around or North America or Europe will turn around or you know, China will come back or Japan will come back. But I can say that the more capable our customers are of engaging and getting value from digitally mediated interactions, digital platforms, and we see this with the ongoing success of Spotify, Facebook, Google, et cetera, to the extent that we have digital platforms that allow for effective value creation and exchange with customers, we have a better than good chance of having a better than good recovery. But the recovery doesn't begin with us. It begins with our customers. So this is uh, like the perfect transition to my next question. Uh, pursuing new innovation to serve or even create new markets. Why do you think some companies might be prone to success and others to failure if both think or have all the elements needed to introspect and innovate? So for example, they've appointed or they even had before a chief innovation officer, uh, the right tools, the right context. Uh, why would some fail and why would some succeed? I, I, I could not be happier with that question because it does tie into the book that I wrote several years back, Who Do You Want Your Customers to Become? Well worth looking at, not expensive. Um, and let me, the way you framed the question explains why so many companies fail. Give me 90 seconds. Too many organizations treat innovation as an end rather than a means. We work so hard. Here is our innovation. It is a better product. It is a better service. It is a better experience. It is faster. It is cheaper. It, are they wrong? No, they are not right. To me, and you look at the successful companies and test what I'm about to say with market success. You look at the successful companies, the Amazons, the Googles, the Spotify's, in America, the DoorDash. Innovation is a means to an end. What is that end? transforming the customer, transforming the client. The client becomes more valuable. Amazon makes its customers more valuable. Google makes its customers more valuable. Spotify, you appreciate music that you've never heard before, but it has a recommender, so it learns about you. All of these companies are using data to do what? To learn not just how to satisfy a customer, but to develop a customer. The most successful companies innovate to cultivate and improve the human capital of their customers and clients. Every single entrepreneur listening to this, every single startup listening to this had better be answering this question. How, not just what problem does our technology or innovation solve? Of course you have to solve them. Of course you do. You, you get nowhere unless you begin there. But to grow, to scale, to have impact, to have influence, 
How do you transform your customer? How do you make your client and customer more capable, more competent, more able to create value for themselves? That's the transformation. And that's why innovation is misunderstood. Innovation is an investment in your customer's capability and creativity and competence. It's not just a product or service that you sell. Nice. My last question, um, it has two questions in it. Um, well, then it's your last two questions, but that's okay. <laughs> it's about the same thing. Yes. So, speaking about trends and going back to, the, to your introduction um, where AI, artificial intelligence, is not as uh, the most popular or the most interesting mm -hmm. thing that we need to discuss right now. Can we consider tech trends we were expecting to have as paused for now, such as AI, IoT, mixed reality, blockchain, etc. What roles can they play in the near future looking at the new normal after COVID-19? And you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embed here my next yeah, question. Sure. What trends should entrepreneurs be aware of during this time? And as leaders, how to decide which trends to keep track of and focus on? Well, you've really asked four or five questions, not two questions. <clears throat> the last um, one. Yes. I, I, which ones organizations and leaders focus on is a function of how they want to transform their customers and the kind of relationship. I'm not the right person to advise on focus. The question that you asked before to set this up is in fact the more, in my opinion, the more profound question. I believe all of these technologies that you mentioned, blockchain for either ledger or fintech purposes or remote process automation or AI ML, those will continue that, that the underlying technology dynamics have not changed. What's changed is not the underlying technology dynamics. What's changed are the economics and the business case. So I believe that if I am an entrepreneur in any of these fields or an entrepreneur who relies on those technologies for my competitive positioning or advantage, I need to revisit the use cases for those technologies. This is not a subtle distinction. You know, when I started out in computer science, I'm sorry to say, decades ago, we would talk in terms of software development of what are the requirements, what are the specifications? And we would build to requirements and specifications. And you had to, because that was the nature of the technology. The nature of today's technology means you don't just build to requirements and specs you identify the use cases, the user stories, and you come up with rapidly iterable prototypes and simulations to test out those use cases. What are the most valuable use cases? You know the Pareto principle, 20% of the causes generate 80% of the value. What are the Pareto use cases? So my view is one of the most important aspects of the disruption that we've lived through is that the use cases that made sense January the 1st of 2020 are not the same use cases that will make sense January 1st, 2021. And this is where leaders and technologists and innovators and customers have to step up and collaborate and say, what are the use cases that will matter most? Oh, Forgive me for pointing this out. What is one of the ways to determine which use cases are more valuable than others? Learn to measure, measure to learn. <laughs> Again, yeah, definitely. Well, overall, we have a choice right now. We can be paralyzed by the vast and dramatic shifts happening all around us, or we can use this pause and change moment to better position ourselves for the altered work landscape ahead. There's never been a better time to become an improved version of ourselves than when questions are asked or abound. So if that's not right now, I can't imagine when it would be. So yes, looking at disruption as an opportunity is the best way to go. Michael, thank you so much, so much for your 
uh, for our discussion, for your speech, and for your contribution to our event. Uh, we are sorry that it's not a physical event and we couldn't meet physically, but I'm sure that in the near future we will. And again, thank you so much. I hope everyone enjoyed the discussion and I hope everyone stays safe, uh, especially yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to have this opportunity and I do hope to see you face to face. Take care. Thank you.